Yeah, so first time here in the Squatch Radio Room. Welcome. Thank you. And what, so what did the, uh, the event consist of yesterday? So it was a workout led by Danielle, and then I led somatic breath work, and then we did, I had May, who's a hypnotist, she did some like hypnoti- or, um, hypnosis and visualization. Okay. And then Cyan led a goal setting, and then we did cold plunging and sauna. Oh, sweet. Yeah, so it was a little flow. Nice. Um, yeah, so I was just stating how um, I first met you at Zach's Live a Great Story Night, so it was um, his first one, and we did like a micro session where it's, some people do, they're, they present in front of everybody, and then we do our own breakout sessions of like groups of four. I think it was me, you, and two others, and um, yeah. Ever since then, I've we connected on Instagram. That was back in like fall of 2021, I think. And I've been following you ever since. And you've been connected to people that I'm friends with here. So Hutch and Zach and, and other people. So I was like, I, I would like to get Ellie on because I have family members that resonate with some of the difficulties you've faced. So whether it was sugar cravings or um, kind of coping with insecurities or things we've dealt with that are challenging through, you know, impulsive eating. Um, but when I first met with Hutch uh, a few weeks ago, I came back from a, an ayahuasca retreat as well. And he told me, um, you had your own experience. So I would love to like dive into all these different aspects. I know we have limited time. So um, I was wondering if you could just introduce um, One, are you from Austin? Did you come here? Did you move to Austin like recently? Yeah, so I moved to Austin about almost four years ago now. Okay. And um, I'm originally from Houston. Oh, cool. So not too far. Yeah, born in New Orleans, grew up in Houston, and then moved, kind of bounced around a little bit, but then came to Austin. Sweet. Yeah. Four years in Austin, nice. And did you start the breathwork and Wim Hof events and your retreat, right? You have a... um, What's the name of the retreat? It's uh, Comfort Zone Retreat. Yes. Yeah. Did you start that immediately when you came to Austin or was this something that kind of happened a year or two in? Or It was like a year or two in. Um, the Wim Hof group was so serendipitous. It, I just, I had met, I'd come to Austin. I didn't know that many people. And I had gone to a Joe Dispenza conference in Houston. Oh, wow. But I just moved to Austin, but I went back to Houston for this Joe Dispenza nice. conference. Nice. And it was a guy sat next to me and his name was Chris and he happened to be from Austin Mm -hmm. and we like, we were like involved at the retreat. So I, um, we were wanting to meet up when we got back and Mm -hmm. I was like, I had this urge. I didn't know anything about Wim Hof and I just had this urge to jump in cold water. And (laughs) this was like, I didn't know anything like ice baths. This wasn't like as popular as it is now. So this was like four years ago. And, um, he was like, yeah. So we went and met at Barton Springs pool and he brought his friend, and that morning they taught me Wim Hof breathing. And I had, again, I did not know what that was. And I was like, whoa. I was like, I want to do this every week. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so we started. We just, us three, would meet up every Friday mm-hmm. and would do Wim Hof and then jump in the, in the Barton Springs. Yeah. And I was like, I want to start a group. <laughs> and so I just like threw it up on Meetup. And by the way, I'm a yoga teacher. And um, I, yeah, so I've been leading classes and things, mm-hmm. but I never led breath work. And yeah. so, in the beginning, I just I just threw it up on Meetup. I didn't know if anyone would come. I just wanted to keep doing this. And I wanted to meet people mm-hmm. who were interested in that. So I was like, I'll start a group and like I'll meet people that are interested in this yeah. kind of thing. Um, long story short, that was four years ago. We I used to have Wim Hof like the recording. I would just play the recording. Yeah. But then eventually, actually one morning, um, the my speaker broke and I had to lead it. Oh. And then it was like universe was like, yo, here you Challenging. go. Challenging. Let's you go. go. I've done it so many times. I was just like, all right, you guys. Yeah. And then it was like the next week I got in trouble for having having amplified noise. Like the Barton Springs got really? mad. Yeah. Oh, so okay. then so I had to lead it again. And then it just yeah. And then this whole group, now we got over I think almost two thousand members here in Austin. Holy shit. And we have about fifty to seventy people, especially in the summer, meeting every single Friday at six thirty AM to yeah. do this it became this ritual where we do meditation, yoga, breath work, and then we cold plunge. And it's just, I've met, like, some of my best friends. I'm like, yeah. the retreats were birthed out of there. Comfort Zone retreats were birthed. Hutch, I met Hutch. Yeah, yeah. That one morning he found it on Meetup. So it's just been, like, the biggest blessing. And it seriously was so 
just this divine spark within me. I yeah. wasn't like seeking it. It it sought me. And yeah. He, That's yeah. awesome. Uh, when Zach Horvath was telling me he was going, I think he said up to a hundred people will go at times. Of like how like for well, one event. For, Wim Hof? Yeah. I think the biggest we've had, it was like 80 people, which is wow. really cool. Yeah. That's a lot of people. Yeah, it's 6.30. So that's like people waking up early and yeah. it's just really cool. Do you have that many ice baths too? Like or how many ice baths do you have to bring? <laughs> we bring, we now we bring typically three ice baths and then people just, we. Three for 80, for 80 people? Not everyone stays for the ice. So usually, okay. um, and usually it's like, we probably more have like, like 60 people. It okay. goes pretty fast. You can do it in like 20 minutes. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, and so Joe Dispenza, um, I'm, I've, I've, I've gone through his, some of his teachings through some of his books over the course of the past couple episodes. And it's because I'm reading Becoming Supernatural and some of the uh, takeaways from my ayahuasca retreat have involved his meditations. So blessings of the energy centers. Um, and then just his book is pretty magical with showing testimonials and real life, uh, situations where people are, are facing very difficult physical ailments or mental or emotional. And, um, yeah, so that book is amazing. I'm wondering how the conferences are. So was that the first one you've gone to? Yeah, that was the first one I went to and it was a, it was just a single day conference and it was like Joe Dispenza and then they had like Gabby Bernstein was there. Um, and a couple of, it was a Hay House event. Mm. And so the, it was What's amazing that? though. Hay House is the publication or like, yeah, the publication company oh, okay. that, um, Joe dispenses like a lot of, they're connected with the Gaia network. And, um, so they have a lot of those speakers like Hay House, mm. um, they're okay. all involved, gotcha. but very much like, um, like manifestation, spiritual, mm -hmm. um, context. But the, I mean, it was amazing. We yeah. did um, lots of meditations and he just spoke through the, um, his, his foundational teachings of mm -hmm. like basically we create our own reality yeah. and, how we get caught in our own stories. Uh, yeah. That's super cool. Yeah. I would like to go to a Joe Dispenza um, conference because he's a magical human being. And, and just this book alone, Becoming Supernatural, has been very beneficial for me to clear the mystical. So like some people think what he teaches or what he portrays in his writings and his conferences are very, at least if you're, you know, an American uh, or the average American thinks it's very woo-woo or mystical, right? But the way that he breaks it down, it, he's very good at being able to, um, so for instance, like the blessings of the energy centers, typically people will call that chakras as well. But chakras seems to be more of an Eastern term that if you state it here, at least from my personal perspective, people kind of shrug that off, right? Um, just because it seems like it's more of a, Something that's not rational or sci like scientific, um, but I mean, from my experience with the meditation and, uh, yeah, doing it a, a few times, it's it is effective for me. Yeah. What do you feel when you do the energy center? Meditation? So I laugh a lot. Um, I I've noticed over the course of many years, there definitely has been some like dense or like blockages within some of my energy centers. So, and to kind of construct a, um, a, a framework for anybody that's listening, it starts from like the groin all the way up to above your head. So you've got seven or eight, I think, energy centers. And so typically you start from the, yeah, I think you start from the, the energy centers from your groin and then it goes up to like your, close to your bladder, your upper abdomen, your heart, your throat, and like the back of your neck to your, the back of your head, then your temple, and then above your head. And so when I started to do the energy center meditation, you start with the groin and close to like the bladder. And as soon as you just listen to his narrative and you focus on placing your attention on those centers, I started laughing hysterically. And I think this is the reason why it's been more effective to, like for me is one, because I've been meditating for quite some time now, so I have some some practice, but also through um, this ayahuasca retreat and being in the medicine, um, 
I like the physical activations. I'm not sure. Like I would love to hear your experience with uh, ayahuasca, but for me, I had like just this very apparent physical activation within like my head and my heart and my like around the, the energy center that's like lower energy centers. And so because I was able to embody that through the medicine, then it was more effective and easier for me when I'm like dead sober, you know, not like in an ayahuasca ceremony, but I'm sitting down on my couch in my apartment here in Austin and practicing it. And it's been astounding how the plant medicine can be a teacher to help you um, enact these be- behavioral changes in a way. Um, I don't know if any, any of that like uh, made sense, but um, so anyways, when I do that meditation, for me, if I'm, you know, I have a nine to five and I'm doing this podcast, the podcast project is like, I'm very passionate about, but it's kind of stretching me apart a little bit just because the nine to five in itself is demanding. And, but I I know my soul is calling this, this kind of podcast um, project. So whenever I feel like any blockages or, or just, I'm not as aligned, I'll do this meditation. And it's amazing how I find coherence and alignment throughout my day. And before I would do meditations where it's just like um, Vipassana and it's simply observing your thoughts, but it didn't have that effect of, I mean, it still was very nice and it helped, it was helpful, but finding that clarity and like almost like these kind of um, almost like cloudiness, like mental cloudiness, it provides that uh, for me um, clarity. So, uh, Joe Dispenza, the combination of Joe Dispenza's book and then doing ayahuasca over the course of the past couple of months has been profound for me. So it's really cool. That's, that's kind of one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on to hear about, um, your ayahuasca retreat, but then the fact that you've gone to a Joe Dispenza conference is pretty cool too. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm curious for you, like you mentioned the, the habits or like just the behavior change. What have you noticed in your day to day that's different since ayahuasca? Yeah. Um, uh, well, one, I find that breath work is almost like a, a must for me throughout the day. I did not do breath work, Wim Hof. I downloaded the app. I've done it. I did it a couple of times, but I didn't really do it on my own. I would do it with a group of men through my buddy. So Jay, uh, this is, um, his shirt, he does the ayahuasca retreats. And so I was doing men, uh, men's park workouts and I'm still doing them at Zilker Park and we'll do Wim Hof there. But that's really it. I didn't do it on my own. And now I'm doing it like every day, <laughs> uh, t- maybe two to three times a day. And I find that it does help with regulating my nervous system, bringing me back to center, just back to being present and having if I'm feeling scattered or like mentally um it's very helpful in that regard um leading up to the retreat I was really over the course of a long period of time I was really improving many different aspects of my life whether it was nutrition physical exercise stretching mobility challenging myself through ice whatever so it was like a kind of a natural progression to feeling called to do ayahuasca because there was like emotional um, blockages within me that I wasn't able to do on my own. And so that's why I felt kind of called to do it. And so, yeah, since then, breath work, meditation, I don't have any really urges to, to drink alcohol anymore, to eat like crap or have any like um, any uh, impulsive, uh, whether it's eating, whether it's drinking, whether it's um, looking at my phone needs to get, I need to improve on that. But overall, I just, I feel that I'm much more clear-minded in regards to prior to taking ayahuasca. So um, the main foundations are like breath work and meditation and just finding coherence with my day-to-day and some people, not, I don't know if everybody can really grasp what that means, but for me, it's just feeling um, 
aligned with every action that you're doing on a day to moment to moment basis. So, um, yeah, that's essentially the differences that I've made, like I've made so far, <clears throat> but yeah, I'm still kind of absorbing everything that I went through overall. Oh. So yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, how, when you, uh, I feel like we're jumping from Joe Dispenza to ayahuasca to Wim Hof, but um, when did you do ayahuasca? Did you do it uh, like recently or of course the past couple of years? Um, my first ayahuasca was about three and a half years ago. Okay. Um, at Rhythmia. And Where is that? Rhythmia is in Costa Rica. It's okay. A, um, it's a like, really like upscale, like nice resort, and mm. it's not like out in the jungle. It's um, I, I had heard so, on, I'm, um, I'm laughing because, i my life is so different. Yeah. Then and that's why I, I I smiled so big when you said that um because the lessons continue to unfold even from my very first ayahuasca <laughs> experience. Yeah. It's like the it just the the lessons continue, um. And I had done my first like larger mushroom mm -hmm. trip. So for anyone who's listening, I was a chemical engineer. I wasn't into any of this. Um, I was completely like burnout on Adderall and and eating impulsive oh, wow. eating. Just like very um, like now I'm an emotional eating coach. This was eight years ago when I just my body was breaking down. I was mm. so burned out. Autoimmune issues, thyroid issues, gaining a lot of weight. And just felt really out of control with food. I didn't know what was going on. So went to a bunch of doctors, handed prescriptions. Mm. No one really asked what, you know, why. Yeah. And then long story short, found like, found a holistic practitioner, the only one who asked me what I was eating, and changed my diet, and it changed my world. It was like the first time that I asked, it was like the mindfulness piece of like, why? And breaking through that sugar addiction was just like, why am I reaching for this? And then it, that, building that mindfulness muscle, I got into meditation and it was like, why am I reaching for this Adderall right mm. now? And it was like, because I was so, oops, so compulsive mm. and I was, I was abusing it. It yeah. wasn't like a proper way to use it. And that put me on the path to this and then ended up with my first like spiritual mushroom journey, like, mm -hmm. very intentional. And that was I'm still getting lessons from that every day. That that one mushroom journey. I kept getting this message. This is such a side tangent. That you are the mother, the mother. It was like you're a mother, like just this mother, and it it in, ends up. I'll cycle back to that how it came up in ayahuasca. Um, and it's been such a theme, but that led me into doing um, additional mushroom journeys, and one of them was very deep, and it ex it revealed to me a repressed memory that I had. It felt like a dream that I'd had mm. uh, throughout my life. And I would just put it, I didn't want to look at it. I was mm. like, that was, that, that was a dream. Like, that's not real. And um, it was a, I was sexually molested when I was about six and from a babysitter. And yeah, I, I just thought it, I didn't think it was real. And the mushrooms very much showed me that it wow. did happen. And that opened up. It was like, I remember that feeling after that mushroom. I was like, what? Because <laughs> I didn't know my identity. I was like, all of a sudden now I'm like this molestation victim like mm. it was just so confusing and i had heard ayahuasca i think on aubrey marcus's podcast i had like heard about it i never was really i didn't but by then i like wasn't called to it this now i was called it was like and i kept seeing these signs for costa rica everywhere and like every every all these people i was talking to was like costa rica costa rica and then two different podcasts i heard about rhythmia it was um just dropped i think it was like luke stories podcast and then so so real quick so yeah. the mushroom what, how old were you were you when you did that? Like how long ago that was, was that? That was like three years ago. Three years ago. Yeah. Okay. And then ayahuasca was Or maybe that was like four years ago and ayahuasca was like three years ago. Okay. So you <laughs> so it was like a one year time span in between. It was probably like six months in between. Six months, okay. Yeah, I think it was like six months. And then I it was so wild. Oh, it's so great to talk about because I like forget. <laughs> yeah, like I like I don't think about yeah, this all the time. But yeah. um so I got all these signs for Costa Rica and then I just heard about Rhythmia, looked it up. I didn't know anybody who had gone and I just booked it and I went and that changed my life. The first mm. week I was there. So they do the way it's set up. It's four ceremonies. You do breath work the first night and then you have four ayahuasca ceremonies. You need breath work the last night. And I ended up the last night I ended up, I was, so they, on the last night, it's a special night. It's called Yahe. 
mm. it's a Colombian medicine and they don't allow women who are on the periods to do the medicine that night. And it's, I've learned so much. I've like completely changed my perspective mm. on like menstruation. Um, but essentially there's kind of like two perspectives of that, that the, just you're so, you're already in ceremony when you're on your period. Yeah. Like you are having a purge. Like it's an emotional purge mm. um, are, are when we bleed. And so they, they're a, you're already in ceremony. You don't, they're like not necessarily need the medicine. And then also your feminine energy is so strong that it, it impacts the, the, their ability to facilitate. Mm. So anyways, I ended up, I was just, two weeks early. Sorry to go into like period no, talk okay. for it's your a, audience. It's a part but, um, of it. Yeah. So, um, there's, I was two weeks early. I ended up getting my period. So I didn't get to do the medicine that last night. And so I ended up, I was like, I know this is a sign. This is like not even, so mm. I ended up booking another week and stayed a whole nother week. So the first week I was there wasn't anything about the molestation, mm. but it was just like, Oh, I remember the first two nights. This is like my favorite thing in the world. It was my favorite experience of my entire life. Like I, I'm going to cry. Like, I love being in the medicine and I love the community. And that's what birth comfort zone retreats. But at Rhythmia, there was like 50 to 60 people in our ceremonies. And we just become so close because you're going through this. Like, I had never been this vulnerable with anybody mm -hmm. in my mm -hmm. life. Like, we're pur like purging together. And like, there'd be moments in ceremony where I'm just like, what the F <laughs> is happening? And just like in such misery. But then looking around and seeing everybody in it together and then they'd play this song and it would just be like, we'd be like, oh, my oh my, and just like yeah. dancing. And it yeah. was just like, I've never felt that yeah. connected yeah, yeah. in my life. Yeah. It was the best thing ever. Um, anyway, so the, I just remember the first two nights I knew the medicine was coming on because I just would start hysterically laughing. I mean, just this hysterical the, laughter. That was, that was the first, at the very yeah. beginning. Yeah. And it was like, everything is so silent. And the first two nights, all you hear is me just laughing and then that would turn into this cry like yeah. deep crying yeah. it was just like and that happens to me on mushrooms too it's just like this laughter comes out and then it it's an energy release and then it like this deep hysterical crying but it feels so good mm. um, but what i got out of those first two weeks so much of it was i think that first week just the the ability to express vulnerably and like i just that was such a flip like i realized how much i'm able to do that now and mm. how Little I was able to do that in the past. Mm. And ayahuasca gave me that gift and that experience as a whole, that container, the people in it. And I think that's such part of ceremony is the people together in it going through these hard things. And that is what birds comfort zone. Because what we do on the retreats is we take people out into nature. We mm -hmm. unplug and we do this. We do healing work, not ayahuasca. We actually will be doing ayahuasca. But right now we don't have plant medicine. We are just mm -hmm. in it together um, doing breath work, doing, you know, just challenging activities, but when you're in it with other humans, it's just so bonding, and that is so healing in itself. Mm. And so that's what came from the that first week, and then the second week was a lot of healing around the molestation. I and it was. Have you heard of IFS like parts work? Not until I watched one of your videos. Okay. Today. Cool. So. <laughs> yeah, well, it's super powerful. So maybe yeah. that, if it hits you, then maybe it's something to to. Can you can you just uh, brush over it real yeah. quick? Yeah. So IFS is internal family systems. It's a model of psychotherapy developed by Dr. Richard Swartz, mm. and it is a, it's just a really powerful framework. And what it's explained as is we basically all have a higher self. So whatever that means to you, your soul, your, your higher self, capital S self, and it's characterized by, they call it, I think it's like the eight C's, and it's this compassionate part of you, this curious part, confident, um, loving. I'm not saying that all the C's. I can't remember all the C's, <laughs> but the I think about it as like the loving mother, like for myself, like that is me the higher self is like this loving mother to all of my parts. When I say parts, these are parts of our psyche. So we have, they categorize them in three categories. So we have exiles, which exiles are parts of ourselves that were deeply wounded. And that could have been when you were a very small child. And deeply wounded can be anything from like a deep traumatic experience to something. Maybe you just got really embarrassed and you weren't able to express that. And you hold that shame. Mm -hmm. So that part is like so terrible. Like, feel so much shame. So you have these other parts that come online. These are our protector parts. So we have, they call them in two categories, managers and um, firefighters. So the manager parts are things like the inner critic parts that, like say you felt deep shame when you were little because you did something. Maybe you spoke up and you were ridiculed for it. So then this protector comes online that's like, do not speak up because you will, mm. we want to prevent mm. you from feeling that shame. Yeah. So maybe it criticizes you. Maybe it, 
tells you you're like you're dumb mm-hmm. and it's out of protection. So you have this exiled part that feels shame. Then you've got this protector part that is trying to this manager yeah. part. Yeah. Or you may have a the firefighters are things like addictions, things like binge eating or reaching for alcoholism. Mm-hmm. These parts come online when you start to feel that shame. They want to numb. They don't want to feel that. And they're protecting you from mm. feeling that deep emotion that's really uncomfortable. So they come online and it's called blending when they come o- online and almost kind of can become unconscious. Mm. And so just all these addictions and it's again, these protection mechanisms. So why it's so helpful or I find it so helpful is that doing practices like meditation, breath work, cold plunging, um, anything that can help you get back to higher self. Cause that is always accessible when these parts come online and then starting to be able to see your parts and meet them and versus like, you know, there's a, things are like F the inner critic or like, mm. you know, and, but it's really about learning how to come from such a place of love of that. This part was probably super young when it came mm. online and it's just doing, it's freaking out mm-hmm. and doing everything it can to protect you. And so what I saw in the ayahuasca in my second week was a lot around the molestation experience mm-hmm. and just, Oh my gosh, I remember for like, hours I was just shaking off shame and I could see these different parts that had come online I had the part that was the exile that was so shame and and the, when I say shake for anyone we hold so much emotion in our physical body that we purge we can purge through movement like shaking yeah. like yeah. animals shake when they're traumatized yeah. and so that was I was just I remember I was just like doing if you're listening on audio you can't see me but I'm like shaking my head yeah. and stuff um but the I could see these different parts of myself. I could see the part of me that was so shame that my dad was going to find out and I was going to lose mm. love and she was panicking. So I have that part, this hypervigilant part. And anyways, I could just like, this framework was so helpful to have because I could see it in the medicine, like all these different parts and I could find compassion and forgiveness. And it was so hard. I remember this one part, I'd, it was so hard to forgive and find love for that part. And it was like, I could see my mind dissociating. Like she didn't want my, parts of my mind, that's another part dissociation is a part is a protector i don't want to feel that let me dissociate mm. brain fog a part a protector part in my mind i was trying to get me to look at it and i didn't want to look at it and it's these parts of my psyche that were fogging mm. and i was just in it so i was just like it was like i'd get close to looking at it and it was like fog out and i was like she'd be like come on and so it was just a lot of that and i'm this is such a specific this is like one night yeah, yeah, that yeah. just was like very memorable for me Every night was so different. Yeah. And every night was so many different elements. I mean, I'd have like four hours of that. And then I'd have like dancing and yeah. laughing uh. and then crying about something else. <laughs> and it's just, it opens up so much, just different perspectives. Um, I remember one night I had, just give me so much perspective of my brother. So I have an older brother and how um, our relationship, I developed very much like anxious attachment because he was very avoidant because I loved him. Mm. I love my brother so much. I'm youngest of four. And I just always wanted to play with him and just like, just, and I got to see his perspective of me and how much Mm. I'm like, and have so much compassion for like how much, even as a small child, I took a lot of attention and, um, yeah. So things like that, where it's just like, whoa, like things I, I like just flips the script on so many things and just how much love, oh my gosh, ayahuasca has opened my heart so much. Yeah so much love for my family. Like, oh my gosh, how many nights I've cried about the mothers, my mom, how much she loves me and just being able to really feel that. Like one night I had this, I'm gonna cry, I know I'm rambling. I had like this night where I just could feel how much like our souls, my mom and me came into this life for us to feel how much a mother could love. And that was like, my heart, like I love my mom so much. So it was just like, it's, just really feel that and experience that amount of love, like, mm. like my heart, like, and I see how much my heart's been open. I've done Vipassana as well, and like, I'm like the my heart to bugs, like, even <laughs> and this sounds so, like guys, I hate bugs, and now like, <laughs> and it sounds so ridiculous, but like I just feel my heart opening every yeah. day to stuff. Oh my god! So. Thank you for letting me just, yes, just no. pause and let you see. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing all that. Um, yeah, that, so, yeah, thank you for being vulnerable because that's not easy to, well, it's easier for you now, as you stated, right? And 
Yeah, it was, um, I, I resonate with a lot of what you just stated as well. Like f- what I experienced through my ayahuasca retreat. Um, I, when I was really young, um, my mother passed and shortly after she passed, um, I was abused by a girl that my dad was dating. So like, as soon as I was, so I was three when she died. And as soon as I was four, I was mentally and physically and potentially sexually abused. So just the, the loss of my mother alone was obviously at that young, young, young of an age is very hard to understand. Right. But there's certain books I've read how just the presence, the physical touch of your mother is very important for like brain development and just overall human development as you're in that toddler stage. And so being abused directly after she died was just like extremely difficult. And I had so much fear, so much anxiety. For, I still, I mean, still to this day, I, I have anxiety in certain ways. It's gotten much better, but it was very difficult. Um, and so I don't even know where to go from there. I mean, I, through, throughout growing up into my teenage adolescent years, into college, my dad and my family now, um, I have like a younger, younger sisters. I have a stepmom that I love dearly. They're fantastic. I love them. Um, my dad was an amazing father. I appreciate him so much. Um, and he was doing what he could to, 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 you know, handle the situation at hand with, with my mother passing. Um, and I was, yeah, looking back, I was, I was raised in a very, you know, after that in a very great home. Uh, I lived in a nice neighborhood. I lived in a good part of Massachusetts and, but still, uh, there, there's certain wounds with that I face and there's definitely wounds that I, as I got older, I see in certain family members and, um, yeah, through over time meditation helped. Right. So when I was, I'm 30 now, when I was 25, I kind of had a breaking point in my life where I kind of, I had river Rudy on yesterday and we talked about how plant medicine is a great teacher, but you can also, uh, achieve what the plant medicine will provide to you through just simply space and time. But, uh, I mean, the average American is very go, 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 busy, busy, busy. So when I was 25, I had the ability to just drop a lot of things and just have that space and time reflect. And so I was able to kind of heal, uh, in a, in a, to a certain degree, but ayahuasca absolutely opened up this field of so much. I mean, it was what you just relayed I also experienced so my first ever ceremony was March 7th first cup didn't really feel anything and what I've been told is that's usually the case it's kind of like your first time smoking weed you don't really get that high um so as I was like sober it was nighttime we're in the jungle so we're like it's not like a fancy retreat we're like in a temple and there's a fire pit it's beautiful but we're in a small temple and it's in the middle of the jungle. And so I'm watching this woman, there's like seven, eight women on around the corner or around the one side of the temple and men on the other side. And and like, so my first ever experience was like watching some of these women do exactly what you just stated. Like started laughing hysterically, start crying, leaving, throwing up, purging in certain ways. And so that, that alone just because I was sober at the time was like, okay, where, where am I going? Where am I going to go? Right. Um, the day before we did combo. So I already kind of purged previously a decent amount. Um, so I didn't purge at all in regards to like actually vomiting, um, during the ayahuasca ceremonies. But, um, I took the second cup and I felt the most abundant amount of love and joy and compassion where I was hysterically laughing as well. And I was holding it in a little bit because I was like, I don't want other people to think I'm fucking nuts. But I was like, dude, you're in an ayahuasca ceremony. 
and you're watching all these other people do the same thing. Just fucking let it out. And the visuals that I was getting, I don't know about you, but the colors and like closing your eyes and seeing what's happening. It was, I felt like I was in a different dimension, you know, and, um, you know, it sounds, it might sound crazy to certain people, but it's just like, it won't sound crazy if you do it yourself and, you know, you embody the experience of doing ayahuasca. And so I too was able to go through that. And then there was, at least from a man's um, point of view, there was a moment where the music changed and the music heavily, at least for me, uh, uh, like affected my experience the vibrations of the music, the energy of the music, it's powerful. And so when I was going through these, this like love and joy and bliss and laughing, it, it switched to just like from guitar and maracas and like, like bongos to just only bong bongos. It's like drumming, deep drumming. And it kind of reminded me of just like um, similar to Native American war chanting. So it's, it's kind of like the beat, the music, is almost like preparation for war and so things got a little darker like more anxious it wasn't even like sad it was like this is how you're gonna focus as a man to be clear clear-minded you're gonna be courageous and you have to be able to maintain your internal stoic whatever stoicism courage and be calm, be, be just still throughout the chaos. And it was pretty powerful. And I could see the, the men aside from me, they were also like, it seems like the energy that was flowing in the midst of that. It's like, people are kind of going, some people, I don't know, you can relay what you observe, but at times it seemed like we were all kind <clears> of, <throat> the men aside from me, one of them was like going to this, it seemed like the same kind of energy of like dealing with something internally and, and finding strength. But it did have this like through the visuals, the emotional activation, the energy I was feeling. Um, it was like I was preparing for battle, which was powerful. And then that shifted as well to so much just like divine masculine, like a, a flow, a conscious stream as if like, there's a divine masculine, like my great, great, great grandfather's hand is on my shoulder and, and allowing these insights of how to be, um, more, more empathetic, uh, with different relationships in your life that you love, like your, like my sisters, different family members, friends, and to have this different perspective of having so much more compassion and love for them but like the flow of just conscious thoughts too that were coming in were like, what's going on? Like, where is this coming from? I have never experienced anything like this and how strong it was. Like, like you said, the capital S self, your higher self. It's like the medicine allows that to come in and you are just at, you are like who you are meant to be, who you are meant to be. And so, yeah, to, to relate, I mean, I am still at a point in my life where one, I know for a fact I was mentally and physically abused. Sexually, I don't know. I keep thinking it's a dream. I don't know. I, I honestly am not sure. But a part of me feels like it wasn't a dream. So it was like a combination of <clears throat> these three things that, yeah, I, um, I was able to observe. <clears throat> and so shame that I've held on to because of what happened at an age in which I have no control over anything. I'm fucking three and four years old. But then what carried on as I got older was like your coping mechanisms and how you deal with things and what you think is okay and like how you should navigate. Like, you know, there was other things that happened in my life that let, <clears throat> led me to have more shame. Like it was like, I'm doing these different things after, after all these traumatic experiences happened that are shameful to me. So in the midst of the ayahuasca ceremony, I was, it was like the second ceremony at least, um, was, it was like the very end of it, it was straight like three hours of processing, like looking into the fire pit in the middle of the temple and just three hours. And it wasn't like pathological rumination, which I've, I've stated that before a couple of times I wrote about this, but it wasn't rumination, like just the same, you know, cycle of thoughts. It was like this just 
water river like flowing of peaceful insights on why you're feeling the shame what happened let go of it surrender to it don't let it be attached and yeah attached to who you are right and um yeah that i i also was able like the amount of compassion and like love that you share with some people that i had just met and i i've you know i have their contact and i'm probably gonna follow up with some of them but it's like you have so much love for that person and it's like you just met them but the what you go through it's just indescribable it's so i mean it's people can listen to this and and some some might understand even if they haven't done it or if they have done it they're like yeah we get you we get what you're saying and then there's some other people that have never done it but they're like this sounds like absolute weirdness to me or whatever but it's um yeah i, I mean i i signed up for another ayahuasca retreat for october and um I'm still, I, I signed up for it, uh, like, a, well, I pretty much committed verbally pretty much right after the first ayahuasca. I was like, this was so helpful for me. This was very helpful. Um, and a part of me was like, oh, should I, should I have waited so that like the elevated emotions from this first experience kind of like, you know, t like tune down a little bit, you're back into reality, make sure that you're being intentional with this next retreat. but. To this day, I'm like, yeah, I'm, re I'm ready to go again. And um, so I, I'm very appreciative of being able to share these types of th these conversations here in Austin, Texas, especially because if I was back, I'm from Massachusetts. And uh, I, I don't, I, th I think it'd be more difficult to find uh, time to be able to converse about these things, at least in person. And um, so... Yeah, I know, I know what you're saying in regards to, yeah, the, the opening of compassion, the opening of love and connecting with your mother and her soul and what she had to do to bring you into this life. And the same thing happened for me and my parents and my father. And even the woman that abused me directly after my mother passing, um, I've never actually had like a lot of anger or resentment towards her. I've just had a lot of fear based off of what happened and the way that my body and my mind and my nervous system kind of compressed it all in. But still to this day, yeah, so during the ayahuasca ceremony, I I just, I, she, I found out, like, a, I, I think it was a few years ago, she was also sexually abused. And it's just like this generational wounding of just like, when do we stop it? Like, or how do we, how do we cut that off? How do we snip it off? You know? And so I'm also rambling right now, but, uh, yeah, I, I think that ayahuasca, um, it's the most powerful experience I've ever gone through. And when I talked to Hutch, Hutch was like, yeah, uh, Ellie was very emphatic about, and exci <laughs> and excited about <laughs> Her first ayahuasca ceremony, she was like, this is the real deal right here. Sure. <laughs> well, it's so funny. I just got, and thank you so much for sharing everything you just did. Yeah. And it just reminds me too, like, I mean, I, like, I brief, we didn't know each other that well, but it's mm -hmm. like, for you to be able to open up and share that to me and just like remembering how much, even just as humans, like how much, even just love and compassion my heart opens just by you sharing that, mm -hmm. how close I feel. Um, so I'm just so grateful for that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Hutch, he, yeah, he, we had met, he had come to Wim Hof one day and yeah. for some reason I was sparked to just like go talk to him afterwards. And then we went to brunch. I never like did that. I usually like, went, ran home afterwards because I yeah. was like, I just hosted. Yeah. Anyways, we stayed in touch. He went back to Chicago and I had done that ayahuasca journey. And then, yeah, I, they, I was the same as you. I was like, I want to go back. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they ended up having this like deal where if you like three people referrals you could come back for free and i was like you know i wasn't like planning on like marketing it or anything mm -hmm. i was just sharing like i was genuinely just like same so same yeah radiating i've been doing the same <laughs> yeah. for this retreat yeah my friend like people hear about what i went through and um, I, it's just naturally like i'm expressing this because of how amazing it was like, every human being if you go through such an amazing experience 
just, we're, we're social creatures. Like you want to share that with others, right? Totally. So it's just as natural, like, yeah, this was unbelievable and this is where I did it. And if people feel called to do it, then it's like, all right, that's a referral, you know? Yeah. yeah. And so Hutch ended up doing it. And then Matt, my friend Matt, um, he, he like saw, he was, he's like one of my best friends. And when I got back, he just like, I was still like, he said I was glowing and then he signed up like right away. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, one of my clients, I ended up telling her about it. And I thought I could help her, and she ended up signing up. So I got to go for free with them. So yeah. Matt and um, Hutch, and then we ended up meeting. It was like it was such a special group of people um, that we went to Rhythmia with. And then so we went, um, and I ended up staying a couple more weeks. But they, yeah, um, those that week time with Hutch, again, it was like this to go through something like that with friends, and you're just like. <laughs> pooping your pants and throwing up but it feels so good and then just like being able to afterwards like I just my favorite moments is like afterwards being able to talk like yeah. come back to each other yeah. and just be like I don't know it's just so yeah. so special yeah uh, it's funny uh, Hutch was also man uh, Hutch we're you're like I should just put your picture on uh, the cover of this episode because we're just <laughs> only talking about you um, it was kind of the same thing I I vibed with his energy when I like just barely met him and spoke to him and I was like I, I kind of want to hang out with him it's kind of the same thing that you said and yeah we just we gravitated uh we we um yeah we're very much uh in tune with each other like on my birthday uh I hung out with him from like 9 a.m to 9 p.m and we talked all day long just about random shit it's oh like, my god that's when you know you're like yep yeah, we're friends you know um but yeah, he he brought you up, and I was like, all right, I would love to talk to Ellie about her experience. And already, I I can, I'm very happy that you're able to express that. And I'm wondering, so you kind of dove into the first one, right? The first ayahuasca ceremony. <clears throat> uh, how was the second one? Yeah, so I the kind of synopsis I gave you earlier was like the a summary of the first two weeks. So that was seven ceremonies. Oh, okay. Um, the first seven and two I'm weeks. Like, yeah, they do four, and then they do, and then I I missed that you missed last the one. The eighth one. The, oh wow, one. that's all. That's a decent amount for two. Okay. Yeah. Damn, you're really. And okay. Every and it was just like we said. I think was some of the biggest things is like, and I say why ice bath is so helpful, and I know that was like such training was like going to get that a next cup. Yeah. And they call that next coming you're like, oh my gosh. Oh, where are we like going? Crawling. Where are we like, going Happy tonight? Remorse, it's like, yeah. Because yeah, there's, there's one night where it can be extremely, like, happy. Yeah. And then there's other nights where it's like, uh -uh. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's been nights where I'm just, like, so nauseous. And I remember I remember one night, and I don't want to, like, deflect it, but it's, like, all, it's all perfect. Like, it's all, it, like, it's just that, and it's all a practice of trust of, like, I know, like, she knows and she's given me what I need. And there's been so many moments in ayahuasca where like something's happening and I, and then I, she reveals later, like I understand it later what was happening. And it's just mm -hmm. like all so, so perfect. <laughs> <laughs> there's been five, my favorite moments. I'll just like reel my favorite moments. There's one time I remember being in the bathroom and just so like, I was like pooping, you know, <laughs> and just like so happy. And I just felt like I was my best friend. Like, I was my own best friend. And me and I were just in the bathroom, and I could hear all this music and dancing outside. And I was like, well, it's like the party's in here. And I just remember <laughs> that moment. I couldn't even get my pants back on. And it was just like, it was just like be friend, becoming my own best friend. Yeah, that yeah. was really sweet. And then there was one night particularly that I, I asked for, um, I just was like, I knew this night was so special. And it was the... The whole night, the whole night, see, I just all these signs, and I knew that night was gonna be so special. Hutch was there, and I connected with my soul. Like I, they so at Rhythmia they have three intentions that you're working through. They provide them for you, and the mm -hmm. first is, um, show me who I've become, and the second one is, merge me back with my soul at all costs, and the third is heal my heart. And I had this was so. I had done the thir first two weeks and I never felt like I, like I definitely connected with my soul, but not to the point where I felt like I merged with my soul. Like I didn't think I had gotten to that one. I think those previous times was just showing me who I had become and revealing a lot of things to me. And then this night, it was like the grandma, there's a song called Grandmother's Song. They yeah. played it with me a lot. Mm. And um, it always hits me. And 
that night they had us all line up and they did like an acoustic version of that song and i was just like i had like chills over my body i was like this night this i just felt it yeah. coming and then i had like this for some reason in the first i also started my eyes, i always wanted to like hurry up and get my cup like just this rush yeah. like i want to drink it first i could like go in medicine like just like that's my personality of just like yeah. wanting just yeah, like yeah. this hyper and um i was like you need to like go in the back of the line be the mm. last be the last one to take your cup like i just had this message and it was like it was like myself having to practice patience I was like, wow okay so I just like went to the back of the line and ended up that the other line was short or longer so i went to the back of that line and i just like oh wow so, so and i had like this whole experience before i even drank the medicine it was just like this um and then i'd asked for two cups if i could have two cups at the same at the same time same time mm. and um and I was nervous to ask that. And I had all this story in my head that they were going to think I was like, um, I just, in the previous medicines, I had took many, multiple cups to get. And mm. so it just like, and I don't know if that was in my own psyche that I needed that many cups to experience something and, you know, stories or just like trusting myself that like, I really, it just took more um, at this time. And they, they have different theories about that. And anyways, I just, I asked for two cups and, and went back to my mattress and, and then I ended up asking, going back up again later and asked for two more cups. And I just knew. And then, and then I merged with my soul that night. And it was the, um, a lot happened in between that I'm trying to reflect. So you did take, still. you did take two more cups. I did take two after more cups. After one? Up, after the first set of two cups and two more cups. And then I, um, oh, okay. and it was this whole, so th that was at, um, so those four cups. And then it was just these. I it was this deep knowing of of why I was here and all this stuff came up with comfort zone retreats mm. and deep purpose around that and like um, I remember dancing that night and I love to dance and just fully embodied like fully expressed in my body and I I never danced like that and I felt ayahuasca was like moving through me and I, I remember one message I don't remember if it was this night but I got the message, your sexuality is your superpower, like your sexual. And and then it's like learning about that of like, that's our divine creation, like mm. our creation when we birth things, like that's our sexuality mm -hmm. and just um, how much repressed I, and I still have a lot of work to do mm -hmm. with that. And um, I just remember that coming through. Um, but I just remember that being one of the most powerful nights. And I remember Hutch sharing at the end because we were involved in each other's, like I remember he said something about, anyways, um, I'm, rambling but that was just i remember that being such a profound night of merging with my soul mm. um and every yeah like you said every while night's different i had nights of deep nausea and just she would I'm, like the shaman helpers are so helpful there she's cleaning you mm. like she's cleaning you out and there was nights like one of the biggest things i learned for myself is compassion for myself and the by being receiving by being able to receive so much mm. compassion from these helpers and these women there was women that would come up and they would just rub me and like this and like i took that back for myself when i like and i remember after those first that first time um in ceremonies and just i'd come back and i just nurtured myself like this and i haven't done that in a long time so i'm so glad we're speaking about this because mm -hmm. i remember i used to do that like that first year after my i would just be like i rub myself mm -hmm. <laughs> anyways i'll throw it back to you yeah yeah thank you sharon um huh yeah, that's, uh, it's powerful. It's definitely powerful. And you, it does take a while to like, it's just an, I mean, the, the message I've heard is life is the ceremony and you're just constantly learning from what you experienced through that ayahuasca, <clears throat> uh, retreat. And it can take months, years to actually have something click in your mind from when you went through the ayahuasca ceremony. Um, so yeah, I, I, I still to this day, you know, the thing is, is like, um, I, I'm feeling this call to the, to the, to podcasting, to doing this and to having these conversations. I really feel like it's aligning with who I am. But yeah, I like it's been two months since this first ayahuasca ceremony. So doing a nine to five and the podcast, it's like I'm kind of pushing my mind and my energy. Like I'm, you know, like 
I, I've never, I've, for the first time in my life, I feel like my cup is so full after that ceremony, those ceremonies. Um, so I was like, all right, let's, let's get into this. Let's like keep the momentum of feeling aligned with your, with your higher self and going into the podcast, which I'm proud of. But at the same time, you do kind of need space of, of time in mind to be able to absorb what you went through. And so that's one thing I'm like, I wish, um, I guess for the next ceremony, just to be able to have that space of time in mind, because like right now I'm just like, go, go, go like onward towards your soul's calling, which is potentially podcasting, but it could grow to, to other things like an online platform that provides what you truly want to, uh, offer to the world versus like a nine to five, which I love my nine to five, by the way, like I, I, I'm not, um, it's not like it's dragging me, but it's just that, uh, an entrepreneurial path eventually at some point I feel could be much more in alignment with whatever my true calling, whatever it may be. And so, yeah, trying to integrate after I, we did multiple days after the ceremonies, it happened like Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. So combo two ceremonies and then you've got Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday to like hang out in Costa Rica in the jungle and the ocean. So there are multiple days to just like take every, like take everything in. But then you go back to like the United States and it's, yeah, it's busy, busy, busy. You know, you're back to responsibilities. And if, I mean, it's kind of hard for some people, for anybody to really do this, but like to just imagine having like two to three months of like not as many responsibilities you hop into like you know uh eight different nights of ayahuasca ceremonies and then you can just for two months just like be on vacation that'd be oh that's a dream that'd be great <laughs> <laughs> so you could absorb it all you know because yeah. then your your conscious mind is able to just take in everything that happened but if you're just so busy with your business and you, your relationships and your health and all this it's like your mind is preoccupied to be able to take in to integrate. So I try to be really mindful of like, all right, well, I signed up for this second one, but like, let's make sure that, you know, you're, you're doing your, you're, you're in alignment with yourself on a day to day basis, but give yourself some time to like, take it in. I'm having difficulties with it. And I think I, and I think the difficulty is in the fact, like, am I being too hard on myself in the field of have I integrated okay? Have I, am I doing enough? Am I, you know, working too hard? Am I not practicing? Like, you know, this kind of little tug and pull uh, of just my mind wondering, like, how could I do better? And so, um, yeah, I think everything that's happening is the way that, it, you know, should, should happen. But uh, yeah, I don't know if that's like something that uh, you face, like once you went through all the ceremonies, <clears throat> did you kind of go back into the, you know, the busyness of Austin and, and United States? 100%. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think I've made, I've made, like you said, like I've done, I'd meditate and do breath work and things, but I think there's, um, I do jump back into the busyness of life and get lost and, I think one of the most powerful, like, um, experiences I've had that's helped integration so much is Vipassana. Have you, you mentioned Vipassana. Have you done the 10 day? No, I haven't, but I would love to. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> Shane. So I did my first one. You did it right after? Or? No, I did that this year. Oh, okay. And so this <clears throat> year, um, did a Vipassana. So I actually did, um, went to a ceremony, not at Rhythmia, um, is where my boyfriend has done ceremonies in Chicago with this beautiful shaman named Tomorrow. Mm. She's incredible and it was just a two day um but ended up after that I didn't really integrate as mm. as much as I okay. definitely needed to because mm. it wasn't like a you know, I wasn't out in Costa Rica it was just like a fly to Chicago fly back mm. and during Vipassana which was about three months later which is a 10-day silent retreat I never done anything like that um it was so scary to do to, to think about unplugging not being able to for 10 days yeah, for 10 days. It's pretty long. Yeah, and I didn't know. So my boyfriend said we had like four hours of meditation a day. I was like, okay, I could do that. 
we get there. It's 11 hours of meditation a day. It's four formal hours. And then in between, you're supposed to be meditating. Mm -hmm. you, you can't talk to anybody. And so, and I really stuck with the discipline. And it was, it felt like an ayahuasca ceremony. And I had so many downloads from mm. integration from my previous medicine ceremonies. And it was just, it was one of the most, it was absolutely life changing. Yeah. And that I really mm. attribute to opening my heart so much. And those, can I just tell you one story? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. There was, there was this, it was the day three. I mean, it's just so, it was, I, I don't want to say it was so hard because I don't want to deter anyone from going. I think it, this is one of the, if you could do it and it's free, it's mm -hmm. free, I it's know. donation. Yeah. So if you can take like just doing it, I want to get a group together to go in December and just all be sitting together. We can't talk, but mm. we can at least go through that together. Anyways, there let, was me, like, let me know if you do that. I will. Yeah. I will. Cause I might. Yeah, I'm doing this thing in October, but maybe I'll be able to find some space of time to, to do it in December. So, yeah. And you could integrate your ceremony. Yeah. Really, really. It, I would have to figure out, like, time off from work, but um, it's a possibility. Maybe so. if it was around Christmas or something, it would work. Oh. Potentially. We'll figure it yeah. out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, anyways, it was day three. And the biggest thing I got from the Vipassana was, so the first three days you're doing Anapana meditation, which is just focusing on the breath through your nose. Mm. That's all you're focused on. And I could see, it felt so psychedelic. I could see the wildness of my mind. Like I could see the ruts. Just like, okay, I, like I would see this visual of like this like Tasmanian devil of my mind. <laughs> and not, that, but like so innocent. Like she's just this untamed animal. And then she would go down these ruts. And it was very like very common, whether it was like anxiety about my relationship finances, things I hadn't finished around work, um, like these just categories. Mm -hmm. And it was like, okay, which one are we going to pick right now? Like, what do you want to be anxious about right now? <laughs> just like, and I could start seeing it. And it was like, oh, breath, breath, like just come back here. Like she just, it was literally just three days of taming my mind. Um, I could just see, it was so eye opening to me how it's just like these, these habits, just the addiction of the mind, the habit of the mind. And, um, and then you go into Vipassana meditation, which is basically scanning yourself for sensation. And what they're teaching is the one teaching, everything's impermanent. Everything's changing. So the sensations that you're feeling in your body, they're always changing. And um, that everything that we're working through in our lives is to notice when we're clinging to something and craving it, or we're averting something, we're avoiding it. And how can we just be with what is here, with what reality is presenting without grasping or averting. Mm. And, through so it was day three end of the day three i was having a really hard time i was like oh my like and i just prayed to god i was like god please give me a sign like i would really love to see some bunnies <laughs> day three and that was what came to me and then <clears throat> and i don't know why that came to me it's just like and then the next day the next day after breakfast i was just walking on the property and all of a sudden, I hear the rustling, and I look in the bushes. There's a really beautiful property, mm -hmm. and there's three bunnies, and they're I just weeping. I'm just like crying because I was just like I, I knew, like I literally remember asking for that, and um, and then I was watching these bunnies play, and it was just like in such awe and love, like love of watching them, and I was like, that is what God or so, whatever you believe in thinks about us, like just whisper, like that. Just watching us play and yeah. flop and, and mess up and <laughs> do dumb stuff. And yeah. it's just, but with such awe and love. And like, there's that, there's just this feeling of like, like you can't do anything wrong. Like you are so loved. So that was, um, yeah, Vipassana. And then by day 10, I thought the day, I, I didn't know how I was going to get through it. And, and then I realized during it, I was like, I now know I could do an Ironman. I was like, I could do a marathon. I could mm. do, I was like, well, I, I just felt so resilient. Because it was so difficult, um, but in the best way. Mm. So yeah. I'm assuming you had a lot of energy too towards the very end, right? Oh yeah. That's what I hear is if you just if you just practice meditation for ten days straight and like let your mind just go. And I've heard like everybody has so much energy because you're just calming your mind, which it does take up a lot of mental bandwidth in a way. So I'm assuming, yeah, you had just you were invigorated towards the very end. Yeah, and I think there's so much of an, a purge through just sitting and your, the stress release and mm. what they, it's what um, it's S. Nguinka who's like leads. He's dead now, but he leads everything, and they have like videos. Yeah, yeah. And he cues and he's that you're that you're like 
I would imagine like ayahuasca, like cleansing. And I felt like ayahuasca moving through my veins and just like, just all the, the samskaras, which are all of our, um, just the things that we hold that we haven't processed and mm. they get stored in the body. And this is just like through that meditation, you're releasing so much and so much of our nervous system. Like con if you haven't processed an emotion, you're in a contracted yeah. state. And so by releasing those, I think the energy comes back cause you're not no longer holding that contraction. Yeah. And I mean, and then so quickly I watched my addictions come back. Mm. Um, the, the phone yep. and, and my boyfriend warned me, it's just like creating so much space because it's just so easy to drop right back. It I, is. I watched my relationship with food change during that even. And I, you know, I've been doing a lot of emotional yeah. eating work for so long, but it was just like having those 10 days. It's just such a reset. Mm. So mm. I'm, I'm really looking forward to going back. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the tension inside your body. Uh, I saw you have your certification in somatic. Yeah. Uh, that seems to be a common theme with, um, some of the people I've been talking with. So I did my first, I participated in my first somatic breath work a few, so almost a month ago with my buddy Alex, <clears throat> excuse me. And River is certified as well. I spoke with him yesterday and my experience with this first one was wild. Uh, I had a fluctuation of emotions, I think even more uh, powerful than, I, I mean, my, my, experience with ayahuasca was, I think, more powerful. It, it was more powerful, but the fluctuations of my emotions in this breath work were, were like, I guess because it was like one hour, like one hour long. And just, yeah, like going from, you're just laying down and you're breathing heavily uh, through your mouth. That's where, that's how I was led. And throughout that time, there or Alex as a, as a uh, practitioner, facilitator, he's leading, uh, you know, through his voice, through his words, how to like, kind of like let go in certain ways. Just did a great job. He did, I was his first, <laughs> first, uh, he's trying to get his certification. So I was his first, um, test, dump, not test dummy, but like the first one to yeah. be, be in it with him. And, um, yeah, I mean, in the beginning I was fucking laughing so hard. And then, it went from like a just yelling, like as if you're coming off of a, you're, I'm a football player going onto the football field. I'm like, ready to go, you know? And then it went from like that to ready to go, but it was like anger. It was like, yeah, like just like pissed, which I never do. Cause I've just, it's just not in my nature to, to get like, I'm not a violent person, you know? So that was the first time where I was like, probably years and years and years of maybe like maybe um moments of being taken advantage of or I don't know just experiences that caused anger and I just like let that out and then at the very end I just bawled my eyes out and it was an hour and it's this like fluctuation and so the next day I felt amazing like so light in my body free in my body it's hard yeah it's it's amazing how we store so much in our bodies as well. And, um, yeah, to be able to release that was, uh, it was amazing. It was, um, something that has enabled me to just feel lighter and more myself to be able to release all of those emotions. Um, but I've never really related how emotions or thoughts or whatever you, you, you can clench certain parts of your, your body. So like when I was young, I'd clench my entire abdomen whenever I was fearful. Clench your, like a lot of different muscles. You don't realize it because you're just kind of focused on the outer experience when you're fearful. And so, yeah, through meditation, you start to realize like how tense you are. Um, and so I can see that if you're focusing on your nose for, for hours upon the day, you're able to just watch all the thoughts that are going by every single thought how untamed that monkey mind is and then also like doing a scan of every muscle in your body and seeing where you're tensed up and like letting that go and so then for my assumption or at least i feel through my experience if i do longer terms of meditation uh for just for a longer duration 
your body is just so calm and for a long period of time. That's probably why you're so energized. You have the capability uh, or you've just been conserving all that energy. So up to 10 days, 10 total days of, it's, it's, it's a pretty courageous act. Some people might think well, you're just sitting in a nice, peaceful, whatever it is, like a meditation house and no, you know, it's like monks everywhere or like just meditation, uh, guides and, but it's not, it's like, it's a, it's a, it's a battle, not really a battle, but it's a, a movie of your mind. And there can be a lot of just years of thoughts and things you haven't paid attention to that just, they're coming if you do this for training. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, let me know if you're doing a 10 day totally retreat, cool. uh, in December. Um, speaking of retreats, you're doing, remind me again, the name of the ones that you're orchestrating. They're called comfort zone retreats. Comfort zone. Okay. And is that big Ben that you're doing them or is this yeah, like, so, if you want to get into it a little bit? Yeah. So yeah. we've done, um, we started just doing them based in Austin. So it just, we'd rent places around Austin. And then we mm. went to Big Ben a couple of times. We went to Colorado last year. And then now we're going to Costa Rica this summer. Oh, cool. Yeah. So super excited. We're going to Jaco, Costa Rica. I think I say that right. It's spelled Jaco, J-A-C-O. Mm. Um, so surfing, yoga, breath work, um, a, lot of, a lot of healing modalities. We teach IFS. And it's just really the biggest intention is building community mm. through doing hard things. So we'll do... We do adventurous stuff. We'll be, um, yeah, sweat lodging at this one and really excited. Oh, so you've done sweat lodge before? Yeah, we've actually, um, we have a guy, his name is Matt. We had, we built a sweat lodge here in Austin oh. and we were doing these 24 hour retreats and, um, we do sweat lodges. He'd lead us and he was super, it's super powerful. Yeah. I, I did one. You did. Yeah. So going back to this retreat, I did combo Sunday, ayahuasca Monday, first one. And then the next day, during the day on Tuesday, we do Temescal and then the ayahuasca ceremony. So it's like combo, ayahuasca, Temescal, ayahuasca. How was the Temescal? It's very difficult. But it was, I mean, I think it was, it wasn't, it's a different type of difficult. I guess it's just the discomfort of being extremely hot for three hours long. Yeah. Um, and there's moments throughout that duration inside where you're like, get me the fuck out of here. Get me out. And you, for me, I come back to the breath and uh, it's a resilience and you're building <clears throat> endurance in your body and your mind. And, but it was, yeah, it was, it was difficult. It's uncomfortable because you're in a kind of smaller, enclosed, hot lodge and um yeah it's it's a long period of time it was like three hours so um but in regards to like healing th there wasn't much really healing insights or moments for me at least in this one it was more like build strength and i don't know i don't know if that's a common or, or if other people well you also or for me when i when i left uh the sweat lodge uh, when you get out, it's like a rebirthing moment. You're like, wow, I just did a very challenging thing. And you have more honor and respect for yourself and the people that con contributed to that session with you. And you feel like you can tackle. Like going into the next ayahuasca ceremony, I was like, let's go. Let's do this. But I mean, that ceremony was still difficult. But um, it does provide at least for me, a sense of respect and honor for yourself because you just went through a very difficult thing. And there's something to it. There's something to sweating out for three hours, enduring, like enduring an, an uncomfortable scenario to the point where you wanted to quit a dozen times. Uh, I, like, because if we're, if we're placed in, in a scenario that's uncomfortable here, here in regular life, you probably will get out right as soon as you want to get out of that situation. This is like, I want to get out. Nope. I want to get out. Not today. Not, <laughs> not right now. And so it's just this constant like 
I can, I can push myself a little bit more. I can do a little bit more here. I can be stronger. And in the midst of the three hours in there, there's like this concept of the entryway of four doors and it's like the four elements of earth. And it's, it's, um, I think it's, yeah, fire, uh, fire, water, wind, and earth. Um, and so each time you get a breath of fresh air and a little bit of cooling and you can have a, a cup of water here and there, but, uh, there's like a, there's a, the facilitator has a few prayers and, and then in the beginning and at the very end, everybody that's participating does some kind of intentional prayer. So at the very end, whatever comes out is you're not planning for it. Cause when you're in, if you're like sitting around a fire and you're, 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 uh, conscious of the fact that we're, we have to share some kind of intentional prayer, like, Oh, I would like to be a better leader in some capacity. But when you're in this sweat lodge for three hours sweating and, and it's very difficult and you didn't know that you're about to share an intention, whatever comes out, it's, it's very interesting what will come out uh, for you. So, um, yeah, cause it's just like, you're very weak in that moment. And, uh, so yeah, I've, I have done one and I would, I plan on doing another one if I go to this next, when I go to this next ayahuasca retreat. Um, but yeah, uh, I'd be willing to do it again, uh, here in Austin as well. If you guys do, you do them, how often do you? We were doing them a couple of times a year and so I'll, I'll let you know, I'll keep you posted. Yeah. Yeah. Sweet. We'll have comfort zone retreats to prep people. Mm. Just getting in the, kind of like we said, building the resilience mm -hmm. and really, um, being able to drop into surrender and I like, honestly, I think I mentioned earlier, I think the ice baths were seriously one of the. They were, it was so divinely timed when I got introduced to, to the ice baths to be able to go into the medicine and be like in line and be like, I don't want to take another cup. <laughs> it's just like, cause like, there's a, like, at the, in the beginning of the ceremonies, it wasn't that bad. But then I think as my body got conditioned to like connecting the nausea to the medicine, it was like, I think I'd like see the medicine and be like, oh, my gosh, I'm gonna drop. <laughs> mm. And so it was just like, but that surrender, like what you build in the sweat lodge, it's mm. just like, just like relaxing into it. Like I can do mm -hmm. this. Mm. I can do hard things. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you could get into, I don't know how much time we have. Um, I know you had a 258. It's okay. It's okay. Do, we, do you need to leave? Um, I need to leave probably within in like five minutes. Okay, cool. Um, so something that I was going to ask you, cause you're also very, um, you portray, you've got a 21 day reset. So in regards to like food cravings and sugar, I was curious if some of the, the difficulties that you mentioned in, in the beginning of our conversation of, you know, when you were young, when you were molested, um, if that resulted in maybe the, the cravings and then over time you were able to have a healthier relationship, obviously with food. But for me, like I, uh, whether it was like drinking alcohol, eating, overeating, having too much sugar, watching too much TV, being on my phone too much, these going back, these dopamine hits, um, most likely the relationship like with those different things were to cope with some type of, you know, difficulty that I faced when I was really young. And so as we get older, at least for me, um, you have a better relationship towards what happened, like the major difficulties that you face, but those cravings can still be there and it's pretty hard to unwind. But, um, I was curious if you could get into that maybe to, to conclude and talk about, um, you know, your experience with food and, and sugar and then how you've grown from it and what you offer to people uh, nowadays. Yeah. So definitely what you said about like the, the past traumas influencing yeah. that. And I think, and it's so, it's so many things. Like the, so emotional eating, so history with me. I remember when I was little, like I would sneak in. My mom didn't buy like that much junk food. So whenever I had the chance to get sugar, I was like mm -hmm. crazy. Yeah. I'd go to my friend's house is literally just like excited to eat their pantry. <laughs> and like, um, I remember I'd wake up in the middle of the night and eat these Luden cough drops. They were like cherry cough drops mm. that didn't have like menthol. So they just tasted like red candy. Mm -hmm. And like, and I think back and it's just like, I was so addicted. I was 
I didn't, I was very little as a child. I Mm -hmm. never had a weight problem until college I started gaining weight. Um, so I didn't realize how much it was like an impact. Mm -hmm. It was kind of laughable, like Ellie loves sugar, like, but it was, it was such a coping mechanism and it wasn't just, I think from that one experience, I think that probably definitely influenced it around like just numbing out. But I mean, it's generational. I see it in my, like all of like the women in my family, just this relationship with food, emotional eating, struggles with sugar. And so I think it's the, and then like that generational trauma or generational just habits and conditions of seeing other people doing that and that being, and just being so sensitive to mm-hmm. it. I think, um, I think there's so many parts, whether it's, a, it's like the emotional part, then there's like the actual physical addiction. I see this with my clients. Um, like in the beginning, it was very difficult to break the sugar addiction and and for me it helped with the abstinence abstinence oh, i was just gonna uh interject real quick yeah. it's also environmental like yeah. here, here in america it's it's ridiculous oh my how, how trash our food is how tra- and it's so yeah readily available it's so easy to get to and it's the most convenient option mm-hmm. and so it's it is more uphill t- until you get into the routines of eating healthier food or even just the knowledge like i didn't even know it was that bad. It yeah. was bad. Yeah. I thought I was like eating really good or eating really well. And I think in the be- that's where it was like I went on to all these doctors and was handed prescriptions and none of them asked me what I was eating. I went to a gastroenterologist because I was having gut issues. He did not ask me what I was eating. Like that doesn't make sense. Yeah, well, it's just how the medical system is the incentive structure. Yeah. Is totally. I mean, I've dived into this with a couple different guests, but I mean, it started a long time ago. Right. And just, yeah, there's different aspects of different systems in society that incentivize, let's just give them, it's a monetary profit that is uh, received through just giving something that will never truly uh, repair the, the um, whatever's happening. It's just like you're treating a symptom, you're treating the symptom, but you're not curing the, the, the actual disease or ailment that's, that's happening. And so, yeah, I mean, like doctors, when my, I think my, and yeah, my family told me uh, when my mother passed, they were like, let's offer him pills. And at such a young age, it's like, what the fuck? It's like, that's how you want to, like, yeah. And I mean, this happens with so many kids nowadays in our generation too. Oh my gosh, It's like, yeah. let's offer them so many different terrible things. I mean. Oh, you're depressed or you're anxious or you're. Yeah. Or you're ADHD, like here's a pill. Yeah, the pill. I mean, I don't mean to say like terrible, like it could be helpful for yeah. some people, but there's, there's just a aspect of our society and system that is causing potentially causing these ailments that we can treat that instead instead of offering all these pills you know so anyways yeah and uh, there's an agenda behind the the food and all that and and but like you said and for anyone who's taking medication like it's all can be so helpful in certain circumstances but that it doesn't have to be the end all be all or there's so many yeah a lot of times those symptoms are the underlying emotions that we're not letting out. Like you mm-hmm. said with breath work, like mm-hmm. we just hold that, all that. And that's breath work has been so powerful for me um, through changing my habits. But I think for the, as far as like, and what was your question again for like, just getting into like, uh, you, so your experience, what you've kind of gotten into, but then um, how you've grown from it and the 21 day reset that you're offering. Yeah. So I, the biggest help for me, actually, this was like nine years ago. I did the whole 30 Mm. And that's basically just eating real food for 30 days and um, no processed food. And I, it changed my life. That 30 days changed my life. And um, it was realizing, learning that so many of the foods I was eating were causing me inflammation. Like I got my energy back. I like all this brain fog went away. I lost all, all the weight I had gained. Mm-hmm. And, and then I got obsessed with learning about that. <laughs> so yeah. I was an engineer at the time, but I just like, this was, I was like, oh, like all my, I was having like all this numbness in my toes. Like my autoimmune issues went away. It's like, how do people not know about this? And then I got, um, I was blessed. I was in college at the time and I'd waited till my last semester to do my electives and I did public speaking. And we had to, in that public speaking class, talk about, do a topic on food. So the whole mm. semester I studied sugar addiction. So I, Dr. Robert Lustig, who's like a big, um, big expert in sugar addiction and I would watch his lectures and it was so much about learning not only the biochemistry of what's happening in our body and like the, how our cells are becoming diseased and so it's like that whole piece, the biology, and then also the emotional piece and like bridging those. So what I, in the beginning, it was just like brainwashing myself. I was like watching. <laughs> I think that's so helpful for any habit change is like really becoming like every day. It's just like this new, it's reconditioning 
the mind and my relationship with food. I no longer was seeing food as this. It wasn't like this, this like mouth pleasure. It was like, it's really seeing like, how is this going to make me feel? Mm -hmm. It made me feel bloated and foggy. And it was like, instead of thinking like, no, I shouldn't eat that thing because it's quote unquote bad for me. It's like, I like really not even wanting it. It wasn't even attractive anymore because I was seeing the food as what it was going to do to me and how I was going to feel and really changing that narrative um, around food, just being like calories or just Mm -hmm. not wanting to eat something because I was going to get fat. Like that was like such a programming within me. And to really start seeing food as energy. And then, you know, it's been nine years now and I haven't like, and I don't say this as like some like brag, but like, I just, ha- I haven't eaten bread. I haven't had dairy. Like I just don't crave it anymore. I don't, it's not part of my life. And it was, it was this journey of a first learning just the, the biology around it and the chemistry. Cause that helped me have such a motivation to not want to put that in my body. And then it was the emotional piece. Cause I would still emotionally eat, even if it was healthy food. It was like compulsively eating mm. like figs or like, like that was where I was I like <laughs> and learning which foods were more tempting for me or like that I'd start to, you know, subs- like get my sugar from like that. It would come in sneaky ways, the addiction. And so you, so you like up leveled. I like the term yeah. you, you up level the ingredients. So it's healthier. Ingredients. It's whole foods. But though, yeah, the, the relation or the addiction is still there. It's pretty hard to get rid of because yeah. you've trained your mind neurologically uh, to gain a reward from the sugar. But when you change the ingredients, it's great, but like you have to now, uh, practice the impulsive, uh, so the action, the re- reward that you get. Totally. Yeah. And I think this is where like meditation and mindfulness came so much into play, which was like, I had to start training myself every time I reached for food, just to pause and ask like, why am I reaching for this? And not in a judgmental way, like a true curiosity is like, mm-hmm. am I actually hungry? Or is am did I just get a stressful email from my boss? And, mm-hmm. Cause that was a very common <laughs> one. It was like just stress, like stress hit. And it's like, let me go grab something mm. just so compulsive. So it was like retraining myself. So I'd grab sparkling water and I'd made a new habit pattern of like, when I get stressed, all right, I'm just, and I wouldn't deny myself of the food. I would just be like, I'm going to drink this first mm-hmm. and breathe and calm mm. down my body. And then, and then it's just, I mean, I'd still like emotionally eat and I'll, I'll notice it. And it's just so much less. And I don't binge the way I used to binge. Like I used to binge eat like mm. way over eat to the point of just feeling so miserable. Um, and then just be in these shame spirals for hours afterwards. And it's just like, that hasn't happened. And, and but I think with the addiction, if you're someone who's going through this, it's so much of it is just releasing the shame and that realizing like relapsing is part of the process. Like for me, like, and to, that it just gets those relapses become further out and less intense Mm -hmm. and able to just like like it happened like forgiveness Mm -hmm. like we're human Mm -hmm. and and then so much self-compassion and that's with like the ifs parts work it's like that binge part is a part a protector part that's just like doesn't want you to feel something and so it's the willingness to sit with that part and like what are we not wanting to feel overwhelmed oh what does that feel like in my body let's feel it like and then just like nurturing self nurture that's where like rubbing my like like touching myself like compassion for myself versus using the food to feel connection mm-hmm. using the food to feel security security it was such a big one mm-hmm. i don't feel safe in this moment yeah. we just eat real quick yeah um yeah i i had the same i mean maybe not as uh focus on food it was uh, multiple things um could arrange from food, sugar, alcohol. Um, but yeah, it, it takes some deep work to just like re- repetition of replace, yeah, up, up leveling the ingredients. And then even though those actions are still going to be there, you just question and replace or, or yeah, you, you breathe, you take a deep breath in between or have a glass of water first. And you, re- you just kind of interject those in between. And then over time, it, improves um so yeah thank you for sharing that and uh the 21 day reset i think i saw there's different clients that are um that you have that are doing this and it seems like they're i saw a few testimonials and it was really cool because they're just like i feel so much better mentally physically and have more respect for myself and that was i I like how you you share those on your instagram feed Thank you. So yeah, I lead the 21 day reset. I used to lead them a lot more. I lead them now about one or two times a year and it's 21 days. It's basically, it's essentially like a, 
I wanted to create something that was a more practical Whole30. Because mm-hmm. Whole30 is amazing, but I've had so many clients do it and they've done it before, but it's very hard to sustain for a lot of people. So it's teaching people how to do these up levels, mm. simple swaps, so many simple swaps and really teaching the mindfulness within that. So it's a very, it's a paleo protocol, but a very modern paleo. So it's like, I include, I have a toolkit that just has like, what do you, what do you get when you're like dining out? Here's a, like what you get all these fast food places. Here's mm-hmm. some tons of convenient options. Cause the biggest trip up I see, I do a lot more one-on-one coaching is it's just convenience and stress and not having something in the moment mm-hmm. when you're starving and emotional. And it's like, yeah. okay, we got to set you up for success in that point. Mm-hmm. So when we're motivated, heck yeah, let me cook this meal and all this stuff. But it's in those weak moments. Like, let me set my weak self up. And it's so it's like, yeah, there's, and there's so many great products now that do have better ingredients. And it's like to release the perfection. Cause I think, I know I got caught in perfection is not seeing foods as good or bad, but like on a scale of one to 10. And if, in the moment, your default is to go get a pizza from Domino's. How can we up level that? What is just as convenient as Domino's pizza, but that's not going to wreck your body the next day? Mm-hmm. Um, especially if you got autoimmune. Like, again, this isn't just calories. It's like that inflammation that's can, can like three days later, you may have a migraine because of the pizza you ate on Monday. Or that's you may crazy. have like you may have a severe brain fog. And it may say like in those antibodies that are produced, they can last for weeks, even months if you have a severe reaction. So it's like. We want to really like people feel so much better when they're consistent and it's just like give you like do 21 days because you can feel then once you start feeling that goodness, you're like, I don't want to go back. Mm-hmm. That's the biggest feedback I get as I don't want to go back to how I was eating before. And it's like well, that's like the purpose of these 21 days is not only giving you like here, eat paleo foods like that's great. How do we make this work into your life? Mm-hmm. Like how do we make it so insanely easy? And yeah, so that's the intention of the 21 day reset. And I. I don't have one on the schedule. Definitely, I always do one in January for sure. And then sometimes I throw one in like the fall Mm -hmm. or in the spring. But um, yeah. Cool. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, Well, I know we're kind of running past the time uh, that we have. So if you want to just relay um, how people can find you, I'll I'll put it in the show notes. I usually do. But if you want to just relay now where you're more active, I think it's probably Instagram. Yeah. Yeah. Instagram, probably the most, um, at Mindful Belly. I love that name. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Mindful Belly spelled with L-E-E-L-L-I-E. And then I have a podcast called Don't Eat Your Feelings. Okay. So that's all about binge eating and mm-hmm. emotional eating. And then uh, Facebook, I'm on Facebook. And if you're in Austin, come to Wim Hof. I lead yeah. a Wim Hof group every Friday, 6.30 a.m. We have a great group of people. And if you're ever interested in coming on a retreat, check out ComfortZoneRetreats.com or www.ComfortZoneRetreats.com. Sweet. Well, thank you very much for coming on. I know it's a Sunday and you were both kind of busy. So I appreciate you um, being vulnerable and sharing who you are on here. So thank you very much. Thank you. Seriously. (laughs) Thank you so much for having me in this conversation. And, you know, it reawakened so much in me. And I I hope if anyone listening to this, just to, um, yeah, know that you're not alone if you are struggling with something and that you can always reach out. Seriously. Mm. DM me. And if you're, yeah, like you're not alone. Thank you. All right. Peace out, everybody.